Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. We will give um, participants a few more minutes to log on and then we will get started. Great, thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Miriam Khan and I am the Senior Communications Manager at Gradient Health Systems. Um, this is the first session of the Critical Care Webinar Series hosted by Gradient, which will take place throughout the year. As we move through the series, we'll be discussing important topics in both critical care and anesthesia. Uh, today, as you see on the screen, we'll be joined by three panelists, um, Dr. Papicho from Livingston Central Hospital in Zambia, Dr. Sweetbert from Sali International Hospital in Tanzania, and Dr. Ndaba from Mena Soko Medical Center in Zambia. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of housekeeping uh, items with all of you as we go through this webinar. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording uh, following the session to your email. Please visit our website at gradienthealth.org to learn more about our work and our upcoming trainings and to sign up for further webinars throughout the year. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will do a Q&A session at the end of the session. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, use the chat function and we will try to help you. I will now turn it over to Dr. Andaba to kick us off and to introduce some of the objectives of the session.
Thank you so much, uh, Mariam, and uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for taking time to join us in this very, very important discussion. Um, just before we proceed, I would like to state that we are going to provide a few minutes for us to discuss this very, very important topic. So I just want to encourage all the uh, participants uh, to feel free to ask questions, uh, share some of their experiences, and give any form of contribution to this topic. So the, uh, the biggest question we are asking ourselves now is why, why critical care? Why do we think this is a very, very important topic? Um, those of you that have managed COVID-19 patients, you would agree with me that the pandemic has actually exposed um, a lot of gaps and challenges in as far as uh, critical care services are concerned. And so from that, the biggest lesson we learn is that we really, really need to uh, improve our critical care services in our respective facilities and respective countries. So it, it still remains a challenge um, for many countries, uh, in part due to lack of uh, critical care infrastructure, due to lack of specialized uh, human resource with the capability to take care of critically ill patients, lack of um, capacity for training, uh, training critical care nurses, training critical care specialists, and other workforce that would be required to take care of critically ill patient. Equipment is one other major challenge that uh, we face, um, which affects the delivery of critical care services. So the list is endless. So we see that um, the COVID pandemic also has showed us that there is an obvious or substantive need to build capacity around critical care services. It's inevitable that we need to build capacity around the care of critically ill, critically ill patients. We know that every patient before um, they die, they pass through a stage when they are critically ill. And that's the stage that we need to invest and be able to salvage some of those patients that develop critical illness. So this topic becomes very, very important, very, very relevant, whichever area or whichever facility uh, you are working from. Next slide, please. So with that, with that brief introduction, today's objectives um, will include, uh, we will define uh, some of the most important terms, which will include a critical illness, critical care, as well as intensive care. These um, terms, they are very related but they are not the same. So once we understand these terms, it becomes easier for us to discuss uh, this topic. So we'll also describe the role of critical care in the healthcare systems. What is the role? Why do we need critical, critical care services in the healthcare systems? We'll also briefly highlight uh, some of the main differences between critical care and other branches of medicine, such as surgery, uh, obstetrics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We'll also go into details to describe the organization of critical care. So we will further discuss the classification of critical care services, some of the requirements uh, for setting up uh, an ICU, for instance, as well as a few details on the admission criteria. And lastly, we will discuss um, some of the challenges, we we'll highlight some of the challenges that um, we face you know, in, our, in, our, in our facilities. Hopefully, we, we should spend more time actually discussing this as well as suggesting and making some of the recommendations 
on how best we can uh, we can work together in um, being able to provide some level or some degree of critical care in our various facilities. So these are some of the objectives uh, that we we intend to cover or achieve at the end of this session. Um, and this is since this is just an introductory uh, session, we will hope to actually delve into some of these objectives as specific topics um, in the uh, subsequent webinars. So at this at this point, um, I will invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Papicho Ndambwe, to take us through the initial part uh, of the session. Uh, Dr. Papicho, are you there? Thank you very much, Dr. Ndaba, and thank you, Mariam, for the nice introduction. It's nice to be together on this webinar. Um, as you said, Dr. Ndaba, we're going to define few terminology. And one of them that we will look at is critical illness. Defining critical illness, we refer to ourselves in a paper that was written by Ned and colleague. It was published in 2016 in the European Society of Critical Care Medicine Journal. In their definition, they considered critical illness as a life-threatening condition that requires both physiological and mechanical support. So the aim of this support is to give back the normal functioning of organs that were failing. So if this support is not given at the right time, death can occur immediately or few hours after. Uh, the organ has failed. So you understand with me that the patient condition should not be divided in part when attending to critical illness patient. It should be seen as a one continuous condition, so that at the time you and at the time you identify any changes, and then you act immediately so that you optimize the outcome of the patient. So management of this critical patient should be continued during ICU or either would start by before ICU, in the ICU, even after ICU, whereby care should be taken with the patient so that the outcome is really positive. Next slide, please. Thank you. Another terminology that we will look at, it's critical care. So these are a few terminology we thought by defining them, we can bring some, some clarity and we'll come to understand exactly what it is when dealing with uh, critical patient. In another paper, published in the British Journal of Medicine in the 1999. In there, they define critical care as a service that is offered to patients with condition that is recoverable. So this service is offered in the ward or in a sophisticated area. So meaning the critical care part can start from the beginning from where you admit your patient in the emergency, the act that you pose to save a life-threatening condition, that is already critical care that you are practicing. So it can be given everywhere and can change patient condition, and then it's time critical. But it's time critical, that means the earlier you notice and the earlier you act to work on the life-threatening condition, has a big impact on the outcome. So how do you come to identify this changing condition? That patient needs monitoring. So during your monitoring, either in the ward or in the ICU or in the emergency room, 
you monitor your patient using physiological parameters. There's a simple tool that can be used for monitoring of this patient. And one of those two is the early warning score. This is a tool that was developed based on physiological parameters, which I can mention, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the blood pressure, the conscious level of the patient, and the saturation. And each parameter is given a score. At the end, after analyzing, you get all this, the numeric digit that you give to this, and then you sum them, give you a certain score, and you categorize your patient. That category will group them in three different groups. From zero to four, that is low risk patient, five to six, medium patient, medium risk patient, and seven and above, those are high risk patients. So you can notice that the parameters should be analyzed as a package, not as a separately. You analyze all of them and you sum them. As you notice, the parameters that you mentioned doesn't need or require a sophisticated equipment. There's no need for a very sophisticated equipment. It's just a pulse oximeter that we do have in the world, a blood pressure machine, and your own clinical examination where you count your heart rate, respiratory rate, and you also assess the conscious level of the patient using the Glasgow Coma Scale or the AVPU. And then this can help you uh, identify patient who's changing condition. So monitoring a patient is a very important because it allows you detection of a patient who's deteriorating and it can help you to initiate intervention that to deal with the life-threatening condition. Thank you. Next slide, please. On this diagram, when you look at the first line, you've seen that care is separated in the emergency room, in the ICU, or in the floor, or at home. But it's the new paradigm whereby we say care is now a continuum, starting from the time that the patient come to the institution or present himself, or if you are running an emergency um, unit whereby you have to go pick a patient from their place where you've been called. The initial care that you start from there should continue until you reach your hospital, the ward where the patient to be admitted, or is patient admitted in the ICU, and that it help you to identify any changes so that you can easily escalate care. And it doesn't end only in the hospital. You know, for critical patients, when they stay longer, there's that stigma that they can carry along with, or they can have some other complication related to long stay in the ICC. So that is the point where you need now to involve even family so that they continue care at home and improve rehabilitation of the patient. So the continuum of care starts from the time you see your patient and when the patient goes home and continues from home, whereby you can allocate specialized people like counselors and other uh, personnel who can take care of the patient at home. Thank you, ma'am. Next slide, please. Another definition that we look at is intensive care units. How do you define intensive care units? The World Federation of Intensive and Critical Care define ICU as a system not a word. It's a unit in which 
a set of principles or procedures working in interconnection, they aim to achieve something. And what do they want to achieve? To sustain life during its critical period, when the organs are failing, when the patient is struggling, and then a system put in place help to achieve this. Okay. So, I see you, it's a unit where you have a diversity of human resources, starting from medical personnel, the nurses, the lab, the physician, the pharmacist, the biomeds, the nutritionist, everyone has a role to play. And all, all of these, they work as a team complementing each other with one objective to take care of that critical ill patient. So the sickest patient in the hospital is taken care in the ICU. But as we said earlier on, but when it comes to critical care, the care can be given starting from the point of admission in the ward area. When patients need escalation to be taken in sophisticated area, then you team of taking the patient to ICU where there's a team working under a strong leadership of the intensivist. Thank you. So a question that we may ask ourselves, what is the need for critical care services in an institution? For sure, many institutions now with this uh, COVID, we've realized the need of oxygen therapy, we've realized the need of a ICU. Few years ago, there was really no need. People might think to have an ICU in the institution. They will say when the patient becomes critical, we'll refer him to the nearest hospital where we'll be taken care of. But we have, we've learned that in the institution, in the hospital, we receive different conditions from stable to very unstable patients. And these unstable are the type of patients that need critical care. At the time of identification, the care should start immediately and in a systematic manner. When we identify that, you will think of escalating to a higher level if you've reached the maximum care that you can give at your institution. Because if care is not given at the level that is expected, what will happen? You increase mortality rate in your institution and you have high mortality as an institution in the community, you are losing confidence of the people that should come and get care from you. They will start running away and going in elsewhere. So that is why it's very important to give the best we can so that we always make sure that patients who come, they get the best that we can give them so that they gain back their health and then they go back to their daily activity. The delivery of these services must be supported by the government. Because when you look at the complexity of the type of care that is given in the ICU for critical ill patients, there's implication of so many stakeholders. And if there's no system that is supporting this, it might fail to work. Remember how it was defined, like a system that is working in interconnection with different department, different organization in the institution. So that's why you need someone to come up with a policy that will help you to run freely and in a very confident way, the ICU and you administer the care to patients as they require. Next, please. Thank you. After defining few terminology and uh, 
identifying the need for critical care. We want now to bring what could be the difference between critical care and other branch of medicine. Of course, there's not like critical care, the very, I mean, critical care, it's a very special type of treatment, no? Bringing this difference, we just want to show how to say, the way you attend to a critical care patient, a critical ill patient, might be different on how you attend to a general patient in other words. But being in that ward, if a patient change condition, you have not to change the way you look at the patient because you have to treat now immediate life-threatening condition. So in critical care, we don't want to waste precious time to come up with a very intelligent diagnosis. All you want is to focus to identify life-threatening condition and act immediately in a systematic way so that you identify the condition that is uh, threatening the patient's life and then you work on it. Another difference in critical care, you act to win more time as you plan for final treatment. You want to extend patient, like you say, as I'm waiting to maybe to start my dialysis, what can I put in measure? for this patient, for this physiological parameter to go close to back to normal? What would be my long-standing care? So you are buying time as you are doing that. You also take care of the sickest patient by triaging them among others in the hospital. So that is critical care. You pick the sickest, you look at them, the life-threatening condition, you act immediately, and then you buy time as you are waiting to implement the final uh, treatment that will reverse the illness of the patient. Next, please. Another point that makes a difference, I would say, it's so exciting to serve a patient with life-threatening condition. I believe you all agree with me. And then it creates a level of satisfaction. But to reach there, you need to be focused. You need the driving energy. So in kids for care, you have to be focused. You have to be a bit more you have to have that uh, commitment in what you do. I didn't say that it's not there in other branches of medicine, but I just want to emphasize on the fact that the stress that is in dealing with that critical ill patient, it needs a bit more of energy that is coming in you so that it helps you going through the difficult time that you are trying to wake up the critical ill patient. The organization in or in the ICU, you need specialized manpower, working hand in hand and using equipment of different manner and that a bit more costly with the aim of achieving the reversal of that threatening condition. So that is what critical care is about when you look at this or when you compare it to other branches of medicine. So how can you classify critical care? There are different way of classifying the care, uh, critical care units. It can be based on the type of service that you offer or on the organization of care, the level of care, or based on location. So let's look at the first type of classification. Next slide, please. Thank you. We said, if you look on the type of service that you offer, 
This is usually found in the bigger facility where you have so many subspecialties. And then you have trauma ICU where you deal with trauma patients. You have medical ICU where you deal with patients with purely medical condition. You have a surgical ICU. You have a pediatric ICU, neonatal, cardiac, neurological ICU, even obstetric ICU. The challenge with this type of service is that you need to have specialized manpower. You need to have space. You need to have equipment. The beauty of this, like there's little fight for bed space. Because if you only have one ICU and then you have to cater for all this, they always be cry for bed space and then patient might miss opportunity to go to ICU because there's no space. But when you have each unit with face ICU well equipped and well manned by specialized human resource, uh, we are good to go and then patient might not suffer to be given the best of care. Next, please. Another classification that you can give, it's based on the organization of care. So this is why we have three types of ICU. The open ICU. In the open ICU, here, the physician admitting is overseeing the unit. Basically, there's no physician who's attached in the ICU. Everyone who's in the hospital, they can never be rotating to have uh, a responsibilities in the ICU. If you have few, maybe it's the only person who's, who has some interest in the ICU is the only one who will be there looking after those critical patients. So there's lack of consistency in the plan, lack of consistency in the management, and patients might not get a better outcome. In the closed ICU, where the physician from other departments, they will notify the ICU that they have a patient who needs care. They will send the consultation or they will make a call. The intensivist will delegate a member of the team or himself will go review the patient and agree for sure this patient needs care and admit the patient. And when the patient is admitted, it's the ICU team that take care of the patient from admission up to discharge back to the ward. So only be giving feedback to the treating doctor from the ward. In the hybrid ICU, the physician and intensivist they work together, they collaborate, they make plans together, they review patients together, and they make decisions together. So this is the most ICU that we have, especially when you have a uh, challenges in terms of manpower. So these are the three types of ICU that you can have based on the organization of work. If you want to classify ICU based on the level of care, you can have level one. In level one, basically, basic critical care. The type of care that is given is not intense. It's a basic. In level two, it's a bit more advanced when you look at what can be given in level one. This care differs based on the availability of human resource who can give the care that patient needs. So patients who are in level one, they receive a care that is limited to available human resource and equipment that is there. If they find that they have failed, they should organize a good transfer to level two or from level two to level three. And level three, that's the highest why you have a good number of specialized uh, human resource and then the unit is well equipped and capable of taking complex type of illness. Next, please. Uh, 
Well, this is a nice picture. You can see in the background, there's a doctor who's taking care of the patient in the ICU and the other one is in the emergency room and the other one is transporting a patient. And the machine used for transportation for care for this patient in the ICU, this is the CCV. The CCV, which is a critical care ventilator. I'm showing a very calming session. We have an opportunity to define and talk more about the CCV uh, machine. Next, please. This is a resource allocation based on the classification of ICU. When you look at it closely, you find that in level, in level one ICU, the care that they give there is basically infusion or titration of medication. And when you look at the human resource that is needed or how it can be allocated, the nurse ratio is a one to four. And the type of patient, they're a bit more stable because for you to give a ratio of one to four, meaning the patient is stable and doesn't require much. But when you compare level one to level three, doctor, when you check the intervention that are given in level three, you find that it's a very complex type of activity that is taking there. Based on the activities, this is how it has influenced the level, I mean, the ratio of nurse to patient. It's either one to one or one to two. I mean, if you have a patient who's from a cardiac surgery, that is at level three intervention. You cannot give a nurse to look at a post-heart surgery together with another neurosurgery head injury. That will be a wrong allocation. So here you allocate your nurses based on the condition and the situation at hand so that care is given in the best manner that they can. Next, please. We can also classify ICU based on location. As it was said earlier on, critical care can be given everywhere, starting from the time where you get contact, first contact with the patient, is the emergency room or is in the in ambulance, you start offering the critical care to your patient. It can be in the ward or anywhere else where you can give critical care. So it's not, I mean, can be in ICU or anywhere else in the world where you can give your critical care, okay? So there's a growing concept of critical care outside ICU, provided that you are capable of mobilizing the patient without failure of maintaining is a failing organ. When you have a patient you want to transport, for example, from point A to point B, the care can still continue when you're moving in from ICU as you are going to point B. But if the patient is ventilated, you will need to have a mobile portable ventilator. You need to have a syringe pump. You need to have all those equipment that were being used in the ICU so that you are capable of continuing the care as you are mobilizing the patient. And another point to talk about location of critical care is the presence of rapid response team in the institution. So the rapid response team, what role do they play in the institution? They are always alert and available whenever they are called upon to do any intervention where a patient would have changed condition elsewhere. And when they arrive, they initiate the care and they start the critical care 
At the time they reached there, as they are preparing to transport the patient and take him to ICU using the available equipment in the manner that everything, every parameter, every organ is being taken care of, being supported so that we don't go to any fail. Next, please. So this is an example, a picture showing different snap of care being given, critical care outside the ICU. As we said, it can either be in the ambulance, in the airplane, or as you are moving, even when you are moving, a patient from the trolley moving from when A going for emergency or for imaging or everything, even in the emergency room, you can still continue your critical care using the equipment that we described earlier on and the mode of care that we talked about. I think at this point, I'll hand up to Dr. Ndaba, who will call upon the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Papicho, for that very, very clear uh, presentation. Um, actually, I was really enjoying listening to you as you were uh, presenting. Uh, thank you so much. So at this point, I'm going to invite the next uh, speaker, um, who is Dr. Sweetbet uh, from Tanzania. Dr. Sweetbet, are you? Are you yes, there? Daba. Yes, Daba. Yeah. yeah. Please, please the, the floor is yours, sir. Yes. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam. Thank you very much, Papicho and Daba, for the, such introduction and also the presentation from Papicho. So I'll take you from, from here and then we'll discuss the rest of the objective. Uh, before even I continue, I want to, uh, to call upon the participant and then make sure we uh, do understand that uh, most of our patients, they will never tell us, take me to ICU or so, so I'll be deteriorating. So they always deteriorate to wherever they are. And uh, either you have ICU or don't have ICU, or either you have a fast ICU or you don't have a fast ICU. And they never care about how much investment you put in your, in your ICU. So I think we can we can have uh, uh, our, our ICU with, uh, with, with whatever we have uh, in our hospital. So I'll be taking you uh, from setting up the ICU. So what do we need? Uh, uh, what do we need for us to start up the ICU? Remember, we all have a, a critical aid patient in in our daily practice. So they, they, they are so uh, called the core components, and these are uh, these these are the things to consider uh, when when you 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 want to to start the ICU so that. Uh, you, 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 can, you can reach your target. Uh, uh, what, first thing is, uh, remember in ICU, you will need constant monitoring because uh, as Papicho said, uh, air intervention will, will, will lead to, 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 to good outcome. So we need to make sure we, we constant monitoring our, our patient so that we can, we can, we can, we can intervene uh, earlier. So, but also uh, rapid uh, intervention from skilled personnel, it's also a, a key thing to consider. The, the, the most important thing is remember, as, as Dr. Papito said, uh, ICU is the area where you have a multi-profession, uh, 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 physician, nurses, uh, uh, physiotherapy, nutrition, there are so many uh, profession uh, came together uh, in ICU. So you really, really need a, a good uh, uh, teamwork. But there, there, there are other factors to be considered because uh, so that you, you, you remember, as we'll see later, ICU is not, a, is, is not, a, uh, a, it's not like a normal world. There are so many things which should be invested. So you need to, to, to you should know uh, what is the expectance rate because 
if you uh, you have maybe five uh, patients per week, you don't need to invest in having 20 bed ICU. So the rate of uh, of patient uh, depend on how busy your 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 site is is really important. So that you know uh, how much uh, energy you should put in in, in that uh, uh, setting up that ICU. But also patient care system, uh, the infrastructure you want to invest in financial value, human resources, and also technology. How far you want to go uh, in, in, in investing? Do you, uh, do you have that energy and putting that fast uh, uh, resource or you can start whatever you want, then you can move on. Uh, next, please. So uh, the ICU, as I said before, is not, uh, it's not like a normal world. Uh, in some areas, even, uh, they even call it expensive unit because uh, not only uh, the, 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 the amount of investment needed in it, but also even the, the cost for keeping the patient in. That's why we always say uh, uh, we should have patient who will benefit from the ICU in the ICU, and uh, uh, we should also have uh, ICU in the area where we, we, we have people who can be utilizing the, the unit because there's no, putting, there's no point of having the ICU, which uh, does no uh, one with admitted for almost a, a month. Because that's remember you have invested in money and uh, you'll be wasting your source. But also uh, on the other side, looking at our client, we needed to make sure those who are going to the ICU are the ones who will benefit uh, from the ICU. A picture I said how you can, how can, you can clarify, you can classify, but also I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit later on uh, admission criteria and who should be in ICU and uh, how we uh, should be managing. But uh, the place being the expensive unit should not be a reason uh, of not having ICU in our setup because we all know uh, our, 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 our economic status. Uh, despite of the unit being expensive and what expensive it is, but the way we can, uh, we can have our, our ICU uh, with the with, with, with capacity and our, our built and our economic status. And then remember, as we see later, uh, ICU is not only about the equipment, it's not only about uh, uh, having a fast building, but there are so many uh, things around it. Next, please. So this is the paper which was published uh, by Andrew and the colleagues. Uh, basically, uh, for the seven physicians set down and car from 23 country, and then they came out. They came out with a, with a guideline uh, to to either to start up the ICU or to renovate your ICU. So they, they are some. They, they looked at uh, wider. Uh, they looked at uh, each angle uh, needed uh, in ICU. So they end up providing this framework, which I think uh, can be uh, used uh, even in, in, in our side, despite of uh, of it being from the. European countries, but I think can be used uh, and can, it can help our, 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 this side and we can, we can start off our, our ICU with a, with, with a guide from this document. Next. So uh, these are the area they looked at. So there's a operational uh, guideline, but also they are the, the, uh, design guideline. So let, let, let's, let, let's take some time and look at the operational uh, uh, deadline. So on the first again, what they uh, what they, they're insisting is as 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 uh, if you 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 recall from Papicho's presentation, you need to to define and set objective for for your for your ICU. Either uh, it is open or it's closed or it's hybrid, and depend on the capacity. But also you need to you, you need to set your your you, you, your objective, and uh, which means uh, we know in ICU we do cost of monitoring and support of, support of the certain or failing of, uh, uh, organs, but also you need to make sure you, you, you timely mobilize uh, the ICU team and all of those should be stated in, in, in your objective. And, uh, and remember other thing which, which, which we uh, should always be in our mind that uh, uh, in, and it should also should, should be state, state, uh, stated in the 
in, in the mission statement of the ICU, the, in, the, in the critical uh, care unit, that's where we always provide the state of the art of the intensive care medicine. So uh, in, 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 your, in, in your ward or in your site or in your place, uh, the way you are calling the, you are calling the it's ICU, that's the area where should provide the maximum uh, or maximum uh, management uh, for the critical inpatient from uh, your, 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 your hospital. So there are functional criteria, and then on the functional criteria, we are here, we're looking at the location, uh, where do you want it uh, to be? And remember, uh, ICU, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it actually, it's feed, uh, uh, it gets patient from, uh, from emergency department, it's patient from theater, the patient from medical hospital. So the location matters a lot. So you need to choose the right place where it can be accessible. The size of the ICU, as I said before, of course you can have the minimum, depend on the on, on the uh, occupancy level, but also you can uh, at least uh, you can have six uh, six bed ICU as to start with. That, that is some of uh, I think that can serve the purpose. But I think you can go as high as uh, as uh, depend on the, on the uh, occupancy level uh, occupancy level you, you you want. But also uh, on the functional criteria, we have medical staffing. Who would be the head of the department or, or the head of the unit or the director of the unit? So all of this should be stated. Uh, where do you get your member staff? If is it closed so that you have uh, people assigned in the ICU or is it open where people come from outside come take care of their patient? Or uh, this hybrid where you have some uh, team member in it and have some, some they are, they are, they are coming from out. And the other important thing is, are you gonna are, are you are you having trainees or it's on course? If if you're in the teaching hospital, it, it's good to have uh, trainees because uh, we always uh, that, that's another area of we, we are struggling with that making sure we train our people and then we, we, we take this uh, this knowledge to the next level. So uh, the other area to consider on the functional functional criteria is, uh, are you uh, are you attaching it to any training and uh, who are you training? Uh, that's short cause, long care, long cause. It depends on, on 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 the level of the hospital. So there are also nursing staff, where you have to they have to know the organization and responsibilities, or the head of the nursing uh, nursing staff, and what level of the nurse you, you you are taking. All of those, yeah. So the other support uh, allowed healthcare care professions, or oh, they are they are really key in in managing patients in 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 ICU. Here we discuss people like uh, physiotherapists, uh, we discuss people like technicians, uh, radiology uh, technicians, dietitians, language and speech, psychology, psycholo psychologists, and we have a clinical pharmacist for the area where, uh, so it, it, now it's depending on the, on, the, on the parts of the hospital. There are some hospitals where the ICU team, they go to take medication from the pharmacist, but there are some uh, hospitals where the pharmacists, they, all bring, they, they bring the uh, drugs to the ICU. But also you may need to have administrative uh, uh, personnel, uh, cleaning personnel, all of those. So as they say, we all know that uh, we may not have all of these uh, uh, personnel in our ICU, but I think we can customize and have the most important ones, maybe someone like your physiotherapist, someone like in return, uh, doctors and nurses. On the activity criteria, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, what should be done in daily uh, uh, activities to make sure the patient is, is taken care uh, well. So here we discuss things like in, uh, interprofessional clinical rounds and who should be on the wet round, who should make decision who should, do, who should be assigned, what, what uh, depend on the law, for example, who should be looking at the labs, who should be following up on the labs, who should be responsible for uh, calling other colleagues, maybe we, we, we need a consultation from some, somewhere out of, uh, out of the team. So all of this should be stated. But also there should be standardized structure in the process of ending over. So uh, either this should be either inter-hospital 
or in terms of so if you are, it should be well stated and uh, it should be structured to make sure that uh, there should be a continue the continuation of the care. So whatever comes in, either uh, in the shift or receiving the patient, sh should should be able to continue from from where the other uh, team uh, ended up. But also you need to you should know, for example, if you are using the clinical information system. Yeah, everyone should be able to manage the data and make sure the the, the, the care of the patient is ta is taken care the way it should be. But things like monitoring and uh, and and the timely management or timely intervention, uh, all of these other things should be also uh, uh, emphasized and make sure we we, we pick uh, the life threatening condition, especially when they acute. So that make sure we, we, we can manage them. Things like maybe someone has got sepsis, myocardial infarction, or or hemorrhage, or these things should be picking up uh, earlier before someone goes to life threatening conditions. So we we, we, all, we emphasize on 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 on, on monitoring and uh, and on and and, and, and and early interventions, and that's why we always tell people that uh, the. the in, in managing a patient, you can either take a vital sign or you can you can you can monitor. So when you on the monitoring, you interpret whatever the number you get when you are taking the vital sign, you compare with the previous one. And not only you have to compare with the previous one, but also you should see the election. Am I going up? Am I going down? And what intervention should be uh, should be put in place? All of this because uh, uh, the uh, perpetual said before, any intervention. We, we, we lead it to, to the to the good outcome. So we have uh, uh, things like uh, manage, management management equipment. So remember, in ICU we have a lot of things. We have consumables. Where good news is, uh, most of our ICU uh, the nurses they are doing uh, this. They are the one ordering the they are the one ordering uh, uh, these consumables, but. Uh, you can, if you have a luxury of having more people, you can assign someone who will be able as possible. There are things like ventilators, who should be managing them, who should be uh, responsible for, so if there's something has like, broken down. So even uh, ICU equipment management, it also should be uh, considered. But also uh, the, uh, the durable equipment uh, is the key, uh, but also support from the, support from the manufacturer uh, is it, it, also a, a good thing. Uh, as we all know, uh, for example, we look at the Gladian CCV uh, comes with the, not only training, but for also warranty and, and, and support, either biomedical but, and also clinical support. Uh, next. So let's, let's take time and go through uh, some, some uh, design uh, guideline. So now you 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 you, you, you there, there are a few things which should be also be considered as as you are you are you you are designing. Yeah. So team team planning. Uh, this is the most important thing. Everyone should uh, should be involved in managing patient, despite the complicity of the team. But everyone should do their should do. Uh, is or a job and making sure we manage a patient well without fighting or without uh, conflicting each other. So there the, the, the are people like director uh, or the head of the department, head of the nurses, uh, maybe uh, safety officers, because remember even in ICU, you need things like uh, fire, uh, fire safety, all of those. So uh, despite the, uh, all of these uh, people, they should, they should do, uh, they should follow the eye like they should be working together and make sure you design the you plan the team in such a way that everyone knows what to do and when to do it. Uh, flow and uh, flow plan and the connection. So this this is also the most important thing. As I said before, the ICU should be accessed easily with the emergency department, with the theater, with the medical and the surgical team if possible. But also if you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, advanced the, uh, uh, 
intervention, things like cath lab or endoscope. Also, it, it's really important that uh, this, uh, the, 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 they should be able to access the ICU. So the layout of the ICU is really important on, on, on designing. Where do you put it? Uh, it should not be very far away from uh, those department who I need or the patient I need for the ICU frequently. So we always want to bring it uh, very close as much as possible. But also, uh, it's not only should be very close to to, to uh, department and the patient who uh, in need, but also should be very close to the to the to the supporting services. For example, things like blood transfusion services, pharmacies, from a college, uh, other other technical support, laboratories, physiotherapy. So all of this should be uh, arranged in such a way that there is access. Uh, to the to to the ICU so that make sure whenever they are in need they can be uh, accessed. Uh, so patient accommodation is another important key. Uh, there are so many guidelines on uh, uh, distance between one bed and the another bed. There are so many guidelines uh, on the side of of, of, of the of, of size of the uh, of the ICU. Uh, so I think the most important thing is uh, is uh, at the hospital sitting down and coming up with your own uh, your own guideline and make sure you follow it. So always avoid that every person, every head of the lounge has got his or her own uh, decision. Uh, ICU management need, need to be well coordinated. So if you say the uh, this same thing, the bed is 2.5 meters, it has to be 2.5 meters. If you don't have that distance, you can discuss and make sure you come up with a number, which is the patient are not compromised, but also you are doing the same thing. Uh, uh, some other thing like accessible to portable X-rays or any other, uh, 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 other, other equipment with, 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 when needed uh, should also be uh, considered. Uh, but also uh, the other important thing is if you if you, if you have the central uh, monitoring, it's okay. But we always prefer, if possible, uh, uh, patients should be visualized by by the nurse whatever they see the, the distance they are, so that they can pick up if anything uh, comes comes out. Uh, communication communication is the the key. Uh, the uh, is the key thing in, in ICU. Uh, it's either I uh, saw so now it is uh, uh, team communication, which is the most important thing, so that to make sure that the continuity of care, but also uh, interdepartment communication when they are bringing the patient, what they have done, how far they have gone, but also even when they, you are discharging the patient from the ICU, communication is also uh, the key. Uh, can we next? So let us a uh, uh, little bit go through the uh, this, uh, admission criteria. But before I, I continue, uh, uh, as we are discussing this slide, I, I would like to uh, to have some 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 answers and your view on, especially on uh, experience from your your hospitals. Who is responsible uh, in in in, in, decision, in making decision to admit or to discharge a patient? You you can write it in the in the chat box, and then we can we discuss this as we we are, we are as we are moving on. So intensive care uh, is appropriate for a patient requiring it. So uh, we we are, we are insisting uh, for pa those patients who either they require sort uh, of support or they will require uh support from two or more uh fed organ they should be in icu and that, that that's that that, that 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 we should always always remember that whoever is in need any critical patient uh should be in in in, in icu and manage it accordingly and the most important thing is timely interventions uh, we are insisting that early referral is particularly, for, uh, is particularly important. So 
speaking uh, uh, the, the easiest uh, the easiest tool to use uh, to pick the to pick the uh, the correlating patient the easiest one we can have in in, in I think everywhere in, in your setup is a early warning score. And you just look at the vitals and see the direction where they are going. And then you make a decision uh, very quickly instead of uh, sitting down somewhere and you wait until they call you that patient has changed their condition. Uh, so always let us, choose, let us use whatever we have in, in, in our disposal and early on score is, 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 is a good tool to pick up things earlier. So next, uh, and thank you for those who are uh, sending out the answers. We, are, uh, we, we, we see them, then we will come, we'll conclude them in a few minutes. Okay, so let us uh, discuss a little bit the uh, admission uh, uh, criteria, our admission models. So uh, there are so many, 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 many uh, uh, way of uh, making decision who should go in, 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 in ICU. So, uh, but uh, this we, we discussed a uh, few of them, and uh, uh, you, you, as I said before, at the, at the hospital or at the department, the most important thing is sit down and come up with uh, with your own uh, uh, way of doing these things. So, the, the first one, which I think is the one we all, we, we all do, it's a, it's an ICU triage. So, we, we always. Uh, come go to the ward or either the patient in the ward or doctors in the ward, they, all, they, they will pick this person who uh, is death relating. And then they will have, they may have even four of them or some of them with different condition. And then they will charge according to their specific uh, criteria. And then they can, they, they, can, they can send whoever they think will benefit more from ICU. The challenge for this one is uh, remember, it's it, it's more subjective, so there's a chance of having more patients uh, in ICU, and then the, uh, at one point you, you might you, you may need you may you may not uh, be able to research someone, and you get someone who is even more sick, and you cannot get the bed. So uh, you have to be very 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 careful when you are using uh, the the SAGE model. So the prioritization mode. Uh, it's also almost like uh, the other one, but this one, you set the criteria from the criteria one, uh, where you have, uh, uh, you have a very serious ED patient who is unstable, who need constant monitoring, and that cannot be provided out of the ICU. Basically, this is the one who they will benefit from the ICU. You, uh, you have uh, priority two, three, and four, those who cannot benefit from ICU. So decision to take them to ICU, it will depend on the other reason. Or either you, uh, the, the ICU is empty, so that you let us give them chance. Or sometimes there may be a, uh, the, the, the another reason where most of us, we, we, we never like it. Maybe the family or the, 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 the administration is pushing you uh, to, to put that person in ICU where you know they, they, they will not benefit. So all of these things should, should, should be taken into account. And I think this is the model called, to, to which could, 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 could be a good to, to our setting where we have a lesser number of ICU bed. But also we have the diagnosis model. And I think this way that we admit patients that according to their condition. As the professor said before, either it's a trauma or it's a cardiac ICU, or it's a uh, surgical ICU, medical ICU, uh, all of those. But also the, the uh, subjective uh, uh, parameter model. And uh, so here is where you use the uh, physiological uh, uh, scores, uh, like aeronic score and aperture and all of those. So here what you do uh, at the department, at the hospital, you sit down and you set your own criteria, depending on the patient you, 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 you meet every day. And you come out with a, with with with, a, with the lens of laboratory, with the lens of radiology, with uh, you come out with the lens of vital sign change, laboratory values, radiology, echo, you, you, so that you, you you make your own score. When our patient have got the A B C D, this should be in ICU. If they are 
And same thing if they have improved, and then maybe the lab have improved, the echo is okay. Maybe uh, cardiology they are, they, is fine, then you take them uh, outside of the ICU. So uh, the objective parameter model is basically uh, based on the consensus of the team working in the, in the hospital. Next, please. So uh, generally, the the factor, or we call them patient factor, to consider uh, before taking someone to ICU. And, uh, and uh, something I, I, will, I, will, I will emphasize here, uh, please, uh, age itself should not be uh, a reason for either taking someone to ICU or not taking someone to ICU, yeah? Someone who is now 70 years old without looking at the condition, that should not be a reason not taking them to ICU because uh, we, some, 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 of, some of the uh, ICU team, they make this mistake, uh, looking at the only age without considering other factors. Because you might have someone who is young, 40 years old, but with a disease who is almost, uh, uh, is on palliation. And you may have someone who is 70 years old who has got a reversible condition. So that's why we always make sure we should not only consider age as, 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 as a reason. We should take the patient, the patient uh, as a world. Uh, you discuss the diagnosis, you see how the serious disease is, look at the age, look at the disease uh, uh, he or she has, look at uh, a physiological reserve, Look at the prognosis of the disease. Uh, look at the availability of the management. So there's no, uh, of course, uh, you, you depend on what you can do. But if you have two patients, one is waiting for the device which is coming from, which will take one week to be in the hospital, and the other one is taking the required in the drug which in the hospital. So those things should be also also considered. Uh, but the, the, the most important thing is the patient or family wish. Uh, if they wish to be taken to ICU and there's a chance for that, you do what they want. Because remember, at, at that time, the, 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 you might be the only hope they have. So we always intend to try to, to give them what they want, make sure they, 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 they are, they, whatever they are going through should be considered uh, also. And next, please. So, uh, so these are the, some of the examples that uh, they, 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 might, they might be considered uh, in, in, in terms of the patient. So maybe someone who in need of advanced disruptive support, or, or for example, the year on mechanical ventilation, or there's the, a the chance they, they might deteriorate quickly. So they, 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 they should be uh, in, in, in ICU. But some other patients who they are uh, uh, in course in monitoring mon uh, and they might need support. Either they are flown, uh, they, they have been extubated uh, from maybe they, they are the prolonged intubation, so we know that anything can happen, or it's in the, they are in the disease process uh, where they need the uh, IFIO2, but also. So those patients who are intubated because they cannot protect their airway. So all of this can be considered. Next, please. So things like in neurological monitoring and support, the, it, uh, it, 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 it can uh, be considered. Uh, things like respiratory, uh, circulatory support, either the need of a so active drug, uh, or they have been uh, resuscitated after cardiac arrest, or they are in need of uh, renal support. Either they have uh, renal failure and they have those imbalances, uh, pulmonary edema condition, a lot of those. So these are the patients who could be benefit from the ICU. Next, please. Uh, so factor to consider uh, uh, for discharging, I think this is the easiest uh, thing to do uh, if you are, you, you are monitoring your patient uh, 
well. So all is look at once the disease process has, has been reversed and the patient is, is back on, on, on his uh, clinical, uh, uh, she, he, she or is stable and then it, it can be uh, considered or, or when there's, you don't, uh, there's no need for constant uh, uh, monitoring. Next, please. Okay, this is the, so how do we assess these patients? We have been saying, can you have to pick up the area and make sure you triage them, make sure you put them in the right place. So how do we assess them? Uh, in ICU, we, 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 we are not looking at fans very hard diagnosis. In ICU, we are constantly looking for life threatening conditions. So our famous A, B, C, D, E is the key for you to pick earlier in a deteriorating uh, 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 clinical condition. So A is for airway and we all know that, or things like uh, obstruction. And B is for breathing, C for circulation. D, we, 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 we always check for the uh, status. Maybe we, we use uh, some of the user uh, uh, gas score, some of the user AVPU, but please, I will uh, add something here. On D, please, if possible, let us also assess pain. Pain is a, is a vital sign, which is most of the time we always forget it. So when you are doing your A, B, C, D, once you reach on D, please do even the pain score. It's 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 really it's really uh, uh, very, very very important. Uh, that's it. Blood, blood glucose level. It's uh. Uh, the, the, the BGL is the blood glucose level. And on the everything or exposed, you have exposed and look at uh, uh, anything which you think can be the reason for the patient to deteriorate. Uh, next, I, I, I won't spend much on this because I think there'll be, there'll be a specific uh, webinar for the, for the uh, assessment. So let us discuss in detail when that time comes. But for, for now, I think let us go that with, 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 with that. Next, please. So uh, now we have seen the 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 the, the, the uh, recommendation and the guideline to start up the to start up the ICU. The question is, do we really need the critical care service in 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 our in our areas? I think the answer is yes. This is the paper which was done uh, by Tim Baker and colleague. I think most of us will know Tim Baker. So and it was published a few years ago. And then uh, these are their conclusions. So many of the of the of the of the structures they, they didn't have emergency uh, and uh, critical care uh, uh, in Tanzania, but also uh, we had issue in infrastructure, uh, trainings, but also a little bit of the drugs, and uh, so they called upon uh, policy improvement uh, in the system and make sure. Uh, care of the emergency uh, the patients should be prioritized. Uh, I think I, 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 will, I, will, I will encourage you, our, our participants, for your time, uh, go through this paper. You, 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 will, you, you will get, you, you get a picture on, on, on the situation and then what should be done to make sure we, we lies uh, uh, the bar from where we are. Next, please. So, we know we are in need of critical care service, but what do we see in, in, in on the ground? We, uh, I'm, uh, if we uh, if we ask a country specific, how many intensivists you have in the country, you'll be surprised. So we there's a lack of specialized human resource for critical care, but also the most important problem we have in almost uh, uh, most of areas. We are lacking of critical care training, and those who they have been they are the trained critical care people. If you ask them, they have been trained abroad or somewhere else. So there's a lack of uh, training, but also uh, lack of uh, political will. Uh, things like infrastructure, uh, capacity building activities, they 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 down in this side. Uh, so the the ethics care system. Uh, of course, at least now after COVID, things have changed. 
but uh, it's it's really, it's really essential to start uh, investing and 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 they prioritize uh, critical care uh, services. Next, please. Uh, I think we, we can discuss much uh, uh, around what should be recommended, what is suitable for our our our, our places, because we are assuming that we are all coming to the area where only the same. But I think we need uh, capacity building around digital care. We need the uh, human resource capacity. We need the training. So we need training on short course. We need training, specialized training. We need this, uh, mentor, mentorship and all of those. But we need the policy that can support critical care. And I think the only the the the, the easiest uh, uh, way to start uh, is starting with the professional association that can take a lead in developing program and support either within the country, but also can be assisted if, with their friends either from our society or in African societies or even uh, uh, outside the African society. Next, please. So this is uh, some of our our references, and then you, you, you can take time, can go through them, can get to, to, to uh, get more uh, information on them. Uh, next, please. And if you have a question, or if you have already asked the question, please I'll write it down, because it, it, it will not be possible for everyone to, to, uh, to ask. But we encourage you, if you have a question, you can write it on the Q&A. Next, please. Thank you very much. Uh, we're looking upon your feedback and uh, question so that we can utilize uh, critical care services in, 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 our, in our area. Thank you very much. So may I welcome again Utandaba for the next uh, session. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Swiftbet and Dr. Papicho for that very, very wonderful session. Um, I also really want to appreciate the uh, participants who have managed to stay on with us. Uh, we understand this has been a long presentation, but at the same time, you all agree with me that the information that has been shared um, is high impact information and something that will change and contribute to um, our care for the very sick patients. So uh, without uh, taking so much time, let me quickly ask for if there are any questions, uh, clarifications, uh, or contributions or any experience that uh, our participants would like to share. Kindly feel free. This is a very, very important uh, section um, where we would also be interested to listen from you. Yeah, do you have any questions for our able uh, panelists? And is there, do you have any contributions or clarifications uh, to be made? Kindly, um, you can either raise your hand, uh, unmute your microphone, and then speak to us. Um, and um, I can see we we have one one question already in the chat box. This is from Richard. Richard says, I noticed you didn't use the hospital bed ratio to calculate the bed uh, space for ICU. To, uh, to calculate the bed space for ICU, um, does, it, does it matter? Do you need to have the patient uh, ratio for you to estimate the capacity of the ICU? Uh, Dr. Sweetbet. Dr. Sweetbet, are you there? Oh. Hello. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. so the, there's yeah. a question from Ka Richard um, mm. Kahalu that do you, maybe can I ask Richard Kahalu to just verbalize the question? 
kindly unmute and unmute your microphone and ask your question through. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Richard. Okay, yeah, this is Richard Kahal. Yeah, um, I, uh, uh, we learned and we've been, uh, I think, practicing this uh, for design of ICUs, where we use the bed ratio, like uh, for every 20 bed, uh, for every 20 beds in the hospital, you have uh, one ICU bed. So let's take, for instance, for a 200 bed capacity hospital, then we are going to have something like uh, 10 beds in the ICU. So uh, I noticed in the criteria for designing, I think uh, we're not discussing the design there. We didn't talk about uh, that ratio. So I was just thinking, are we still using that or we still look at uh, the flow of patients uh, uh, or the demand for beds in the ICU to determine how many beds we're going to have for the ICU? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, as I said before, uh, these criteria are there, but the most important thing is the, is the, is the clinic. For example, uh, during COVID, the demand went almost uh, uh, 100 times, yeah? So that uh, uh, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, that, that criteria could not be filled up. And that's why I, I emphasized more on uh, when designing the ICU, uh, please project your rate of uh, occupants because you, you don't want to have ICU which with, with almost empty bed but you don't want to start an ICU, which will all, you have to filter patient uh, very much. So uh, with the current situation, I think uh, looking at the, uh, projecting the demand is what I'd advised more, because the, uh, the, the, the situation is a little bit dynamic and that's why the, the, what is, the, and that is what was emphasized in, the, in, in, in that guideline. If we could take time, you, uh, I might share, we can share it in, in the, in the, when we share the, the material, we will go through it. It's emphasized more looking at, uh, you 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 are open slate than, than the the previous number we, we, we used to to uh, to use and I think this is more because we are for the past three four years for the past three to two years uh, the the need for ICU has been increased dramatically and we we are, we are now doing really stabilizing so I will encourage you to go with the uh, projected uh, uh, ICU uh, open slate than that number. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sweetbet, uh, for that uh, response. I hope uh, it's been satisfactory for, for Richard. Thank you so much, Richard, for asking. Um, the other question in the chat box uh, from Kevin Okechi. Kevin says, I find doctors outside anesthesia uh, feel anesthesiologists are not true intensivists. What has been your experience in advocacy for the anesthesiologist? Uh, Dr. Papicho. Yes, Dr. Ndaba. Yes. So I don't, I don't want to yeah. be biased being anesthesiologist, but I want to answer to the question. OK. Um, of late, we've noticed that intensivists are now coming from different departments. Initially, it was a domain that was purely reserved to anesthesiologists because they have an added advantage. When you look at what is used in the ICU, it most like ICU, it's a anesthesia care being given out of theater. So there's that practice of manipulating delicate drugs, delicate equipment that is well understood and uh, well managed by anesthesiologists. Of course, you can have a non-anesthesiologist who trained in subspecialty of ICU, and then they have a better understanding of uh, the critical care part of it. But I still feel that the anesthesiologist have an added advantage to be an intensivist than any other specialties. Thank you. I thank you so much, Dr. Papicho, <clears throat> for that precise response. Um, 
I will be shortly be inviting uh, Dr. Dati uh, to make a quick comment. Um, Dr. Dati is an experienced um, anesthesiologist from Nigeria. Um, I would like him to come in with, with a comment on this question, which was posed earlier during the presentation. Um, the question is, whose responsibility is it to make the decision to admit the patient in ICU? So we had um, various responses in the chat box. Uh, Okechi says it's the primary doctor in the ICU. Um, uh, it's the intensivist. Uh, Richard says it's a team decision between ICU team and the attending doctors. Uh, Christine, Christine says it's the doctor in charge uh, of the ICU. Regina says the doctor in charge of the ICU. Alan says it's a critical care uh, uh, duty doctor in coordination with a consultant intensivist. Uh, Shufa Ali says it's a doctor in charge. Uh, Sylvia says it's the patient. Interesting. Uh, Karim says it's the multidisciplinary team. Chileshe says it's a consultant in the unit with consultation from the ICU nurse. Yeah, so these are some of the responses we had to that question regarding uh, whose, whose responsibility uh, is it to make uh, the decision to admit the patient to ICU. May I invite Dr. Dati to make a contribution on this, uh, on this um, question uh, under discussion. Dr. Dati, are you there? Hello, Dr. Dati. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I'm on transit. I'm driving, but fortunately, I'm within the city. I'm outside Kano at the moment. I just managed to log on driving and listening to some of those interesting lectures. Now, I had the questions and I had the comments. So I'll quickly say that in admitting the patient, it is the primary or the attending doctor or the team that initiate the process. By sending the consult or calling the ICU, depending on what type of communication system you put in place, and then highlighting the need for the ICU admission. So now the ICU team, which comprises mostly of the, uh, it is a, the anesthesiologist and team that will review to see uh, what kind of care uh, will this patient receive in the ICU. In other words, you want to look at the benefits of admitting the patient to the ICU. Remember when you look at the discharge, admission discharge criteria, you want to take patients that have um, um, recoverable conditions or reversible, let me put it that way. So now when the patient is in the, in the ICU, now the discharge is not solely the intensivist or the anesthetist in charge of the ICU, no. But that team or the anesthesiologist or the intensivist in charge or his team will now initiate the process of discharge. You will mount your evidence. When you review the patient, you document. Patient is saturating uh, um, 96, 97% of room air. You know, you mentioned the hours. No other treating uh, condition that will run the patient to stay in the ICU. And then you inform the attending team, the primary team, because we don't own the patient in the ICU, but we, are, we co manage the patient when the patient lands in the ICU. So that is my take on that. So it is, uh, it is not, it, it shouldn't be left to one person or one specialist alone. But you can see in the admission process, we can't go and grab patients from the ward. I've seen many patients that will need ICU care, but they didn't initiate it. But when you have this uh, rapid response team, you know, where you identify a critically ill patient to start managing them and see whether they will need ICU because that's the time you will be able to manage them in the ICU 
uh, and then recovery will be quicker and then you are managing your bed space uh, properly. So this is my take. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dati, for your very, very valuable and experiential comments. We really, really appreciate uh, you being around with us <laughs> and discuss very important topic. So I also want to thank everyone who has made their valuable contributions uh, in the chat box. Um, in the interest of time, uh, please, in our respective WhatsApp platforms, feel free to continue interacting with us because I think uh, most of us are part of those WhatsApp platforms through which you received the, 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 the invitation to this webinar. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask uh, in, in our WhatsApp our platforms and we, we shall be able to respond to them. Uh, at this point, as we conclude, I would like to invite um, Magdalena to just close, give some closing remarks. And then after that, we will end the, the session. Magdalena, please. Thank you, Dr. Ndaba. Um, thank you so much for uh, our participants for taking your time to, to, to join us um, in this webinar. Um, please look out for more webinars on critical care training. Um, just a snapshot that this came out um, after COVID-19 where we just, where gradient health systems distributed lots of CCVs are, um, around different countries. And um, just to give you, um, a short preview of, of what Gradient does is that we do not only sell the machine, but the machine comes with three years warranty and critical and technical training. That is to make sure that uh, the machines are being used. And that's why we have a cohort of trainers who also joined uh, this webinar. Uh, Dr. Dati, Dr. Emmanuel Bomani, Dr. Ivan Sanga, Dr. Julian Chomba, Dr. Shweika and for seeing to get into Zimbabwe, we were joined by Dr. Tafadwa, uh, just to recognize them. Um, and um, the, the presenters, Dr. Ndaba, Papicho, Dr. Papicho and Dr. Sweetbat have been uh, one of our, uh, have been some of our, our very, very good trainers who support us on the clinical care training. So for those who joined and have not used our machines, um, we look forward into talking, talking to you and yeah, and distributing our machines to your hospital. It comes with a full package, three years warranty, critical care training, and technical technical training, and a robust outreach uh, for the three years to find out if um, the the machines are being used very well or you're having any challenges. Um, and thank you very much, uh, team. Um, yeah, mine is to just thank you and look out for more webinars. And in case you have any, any questions, as, as Dr. Ndaba said, send them on our WhatsApp platforms. And for those who do not are not in our WhatsApp platforms, uh, please, you can send your questions and customers at gradienthealth.org. Thank you and welcome for next time's webinar. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And this brings us to the end of the, today's session, and we shall see you next month. Thank you so much.